Good morning and welcome to Adult Sabbath School for our virtual camp meeting. My name is David Wright and I'm going to try and take us through a brief summary of the lesson. And our lesson today is entitled, The Promise, God's Everlasting Covenant. But before we begin, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we open your word this morning, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here in our midst, that you will guide and direct our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning I want to look at three components, if you will, of our lesson. We first want to look at a concise description of the new covenant. We'll start there. Then we'll do something under the title, Change of Heart. And then lastly, an inclusive covenant. Those are the three pieces we're going to try and break down. So for this first piece, a concise description of the new covenant. What is the new covenant? And to begin, I'm going to start our reading in Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 31 the book of jeremiah chapter 31 beginning verse 31 and it reads like this behold the days are coming speaking of jesus coming says the lord when i will make a new covenant with the house of israel and with the house of judah and this would be ratified by the blood of christ verse 32 not according to the covenant i made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, 
my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant, verse 33, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And then verse 34, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will for forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Uh, that's a beautiful verse uh, that talks about this new covenant, if you will. And maybe we could ask the question, who is the initiator of this new covenant? Well, it says very plainly in the verse, God is the initiator of the new covenant. And as far as which law is being written on our hearts, what law is the Lord referring to? Through the Holy Spirit, God's Ten Commandment law was to be written in their hearts, in our hearts. So what is the difference, you might ask, between the Old and New Covenant? Well, let's go back. In a preliminary form, the first covenant, or the Old Covenant, was made with Adam at the fall in Genesis, and then later with Noah. But it was first with Abraham and his descendants that the covenant became fully effective. The covenant was then ratified in a more formal way at Sinai, when Israel as a nation bound itself to comply with the divine requirements and accepted the promises. And you recall when they said, all that you have said we will do. After centuries of faithlessness to their promise to cooperate with God, Israel was released from the covenant and permitted to go into captivity. And then later on, returning from captivity, Israel was restored to that covenant relationship and God promised to make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. But in rejecting and crucifying Christ, the Jewish people renounced the covenant and were rejected as the chosen people. But at the same time, God transferred the privileges and responsibilities of the covenant relationship to his new chosen people, the Christian church. Matthew 21, 43 says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Also in Galatians 3, 29, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So when are you heirs? When you are in Christ. So again, essentially, the provisions and conditions and objectives of the two covenants are identical. The chief difference is that the old covenant was made with Israel as a nation, whereas the new is made with the individual believer in Christ. And so this new covenant is also called, in other places in Scripture, an everlasting covenant. Sometimes we come across people that would ask, but we're no longer expected to obey the Ten Commandments. We're under grace. We're under the New Covenant, they might say. Oftentimes people will point to Matthew chapter 22, where Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. But in this passage, Jesus is not doing away with the law, but rather he's summarizing the law as given in the Old Testament. The fact is, he's actually quoting the Old Testament, both in Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. Jesus went on to say, On these two hang all the law and the prophets. And we see that in the first four commandments, how to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And in the last six, we are seeing how to love our neighbor as ourselves. God desires our attitude will be different. He says, If you love me, keep my commandments in John 14 15 but you still may be asking how is that new heart possible how can I love God and follow his covenant not based on obligation or fear or punishment there's some beautiful promises in God's Word Psalm 51 beginning in verse 10 create in me a clean heart O God and renew a right spirit within me Matthew 7 verse 7 ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and the door will be open to you 
Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. And lastly, Revelation 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, he promises, I will come in. So moving on to the second section of our study entitled, A Change of Heart. What does that look like? <clears throat> Several verses out of Ezekiel describe that. Ezekiel 11, chapter, or chapter 11, verse 19. Then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them, and take the stony heart out of their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh. In chapter 18, verse 31 of Ezekiel, it says, Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? And then in Ezekiel 36, verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Notice the emphasis there over and over and over. God is saying, I will do this. There's this element of let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Our job is to let, and he promises he will do. He will renew, he will change, he will give us a new heart and a new spirit within us. And the last piece we're going to look at this morning is the fact that the new covenant is an inclusive covenant. Who's able to partake of this new covenant? Do I have to be a descendant of Abraham? We find the answer in Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preaching the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So that means it's open to all who believe. Isaiah 55 verse 6 and 7 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Friends, the good news is the new covenant is open to all. I also like the verse from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2 verse 11 to 13. He says, therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, that, that, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Friends, that's good news. Have you accepted the gracious and loving offer of that covenant? God's offer to forgive your sins and to give you a new heart. And have you done that recently? Have you done that today? Is that something you do each day? In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, it talks about a better covenant established on better promises. What exactly does that mean? Well, in Hebrews chapter 9, beginning verse 11, we get more clarification on that. It says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ? And so how are the promises of the new covenant better than the promises made in the old covenant? Well, you remember when Moses brought down the Ten Commandments on Sinai, what was the response? 
all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. But we could contrast that, I suppose, with Jeremiah 31, 33, speaking of the new covenant. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The new covenant rests solely on what God will do for us. Friends, do you want that new covenant experience today? Do you want to stand on the promises of God, not your own promises that are like ropes of sand, but on the promises of God's grace and his love and his care and his power to forgive you of your sins and to give you that new heart, that new life to live in covenant relationship with him. I don't know about you, but I do. By God's grace, I want to allow he that began a good work in me to bring it about unto completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this new covenant that you make with us, that each of us can be grafted in as your child, as a son, and as a daughter of the King, and that we can lean fully and completely on your blood that was shed for us. That this new covenant experience may be ours today, that through Christ and in Christ and by Christ, we may have life and may have it more abundantly. Thank you for these precious promises on which we stand this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome to another day of camp meeting in 2021. I know it's disappointing that we're all not together, but it is so exciting that we can still hear the Word of God being preached to us and get the inspiration of what camp meeting is all about. And so I just want to welcome you once again to another time that we can be inspired through our camp meeting speakers. Hi, my name is Abdwali, and I'm going to be sharing how I know Jesus lives. So, not a lot of people know this, but when I was younger, about, I think maybe nine or ten, I had surgery on my back, and um, before the doctors even knew anything about this. I had it for about, since I was at least maybe three. And since the doctors didn't know about it, they said it had to be treated right away or that I could have died. So we go to, we go for a checkup and the my doctor my yeah my doctor she saw like a lump in my back and and she said that it was a tumor so my mom got really scared because she they sent me to the hospital right away and they said that this tumor was cancerous and it had spread to maybe around here, which is closest to my heart. And they said if they left it for any longer, then I could have died. So we go to the doctor's office and that same day, they performed the surgery. So Right now it's about like midnight because according to everyone else, the surgery took about 
four hours, but since I was knocked out, it took maybe like 30 minutes. So, according to the doctors, I was supposed to stay from, from the recovery for at least a good three weeks. But when they check, they check every day to make sure that you're okay. And I left about two days after the surgery. And to me, that was just a miracle, considering I didn't have to stay in the doctor's office for a long time. And that's just how I see Jesus lives. Hi, my name is Sharon and I know Jesus lives because miracles happen. I mean, there's some things that science just can't explain. When I was a little girl, about five years old, I would ask for snow and a sister. And on my birthday, it snowed. I mean, the fork, like weather forecast can tell us when the snow is coming, but I live in Myrtle Beach and snow for one is very rare. But on my birthday, it just felt so surreal, it was not just a coincidence. I think God specially made it on my birthday. And my second prayer was for a sister, and I got a sister. There's a 50-50 chance that I could get a sister. If I had a brother, it wouldn't be a problem, but I got a sister. And my sister, when she grew up, she wanted a little brother, but she didn't want just the little brother. She wanted two little brothers so that they can play with each other. And the fact is that before my mom knew she was pregnant, my sister told my mom that she had a baby inside of her, and two of them. And when we went to check it out, she actually had twins. I don't think that's a coincidence either. I think God gave us the gift of twins, baby twins, just as we asked for. He answers our prayers. That's why I know Jesus lives. In 2020, I met a gentleman by the name of Tommy Hill. Tommy Hill had, for years, been studying about the Seventh-day Sabbath. Tommy Hill is an interesting individual. He is a retired railroad engineer. He was born in Wilmington, North Carolina. At the age of five years old, he started going to the Southern Baptist Church. And he recalls at the age of seven, being baptized for the first time, at the age of nine, he committed his heart to the Lord. Being raised in the church there in Wilmington, he eventually later on grew up and moved to, I think, Charlotte or Salisbury area. Tommy, at some point in his life, became interested in biblical prophecy. He, in 1980, was married, and shortly after, he discovered amazing facts. And he recalls specifically every Sunday being excited about coming home after church only to see the Amazing Facts broadcast. So this would continue on for a number of years. So Tommy was convinced of the Seventh-day Sabbath and all of the other fundamental beliefs. However, after being convicted, Tommy expressed anger toward God for several years. In fact, for 20 years, Tommy would say, um, Lord, how could I be wrong? How could this be the wrong day? I love my church. How could a church that I love so much be wrong? And so Tommy finally surrendered his heart to the Lord. And so one day he decided six months prior to meeting him that he was just going to go and find the church. Well, lo and behold, there was a church right down the road from where he was living, the Concord Seventh-day Adventist Church. So Tommy discovers the church, and he admits that he didn't come the first time, but he called the church, and the head elder, which was Melvin Brannan, he answered the phone, and I praise the Lord for faithful head elders and receptionists. And the first thing comes out of Tommy's mouth is, I'm a Southern Baptist, and I want to transfer my membership to the Concord Seventh Adventist Church. 
So immediately we established a relationship with him. Tommy was invited to come to church. And finally on this first Sabbath, I think it was in, in February of 2020, uh, Tommy was invited to join. We invited him to join the inquirer's class. And there Tommy has been with us just before the shutdown. He was in every study, uh, every Sabbath, and he expressed a strong desire to join our church. Last month in March, I approached Tommy about considering joining our church, either through profession of faith or through baptism. And I explained to him the, um, that if he wanted to be baptized, we recommend that. If, if, if you want to join by profession of faith, you feel that your baptism was legit and you've maintained your walk with the Lord, then we accept you by profession of faith. But Tommy says, no, I want to start fresh. I want to be baptized. So Tommy entered into the waters of baptism with, uh, along with his friend Eva Montoya, who is also in our inquirers class. Tommy had been studying for 20 years, admitted that he was upset with the Lord. So this was a high day, a high day for him. And up to this point, Tommy had been trying to witness to his, his family, meaning uh, particularly his wife and his daughter. They have not been openly accepting of the message, naturally because it was new to them. And so Tommy just kind of backed off of them for some time. But on the day of the baptism, they were all there present to support him in his decision. As you can see in this story of Tommy Hill and Eva Mentoya, evangelism plays an important role in reaching souls and sharing God's love throughout the world, particularly here in the Carolina Conference. You know, we're not amazing facts, we're not it is written, but we do ministry that partners with these different ministries. We are, in fact, representatives of Amazing Facts. When we go out and um, follow up with those Bible studies that come from Amazing Facts, we, we encourage people to come. But I like to encourage you to think on a different level. We do evangelism too, as well, in the Carolina Conference through Share Him, through uh, evangelistic meetings. In fact, we're planning on doing some meetings this year. And all that is made possible through your giving, through giving to evangelism. If you go to our Carolina Conference website, there is a link where you can give on a regular basis. You can be a one-time giver. But we'd like to encourage you to give because had it not been for evangelism, I probably would not have met Tommy Hill. And there are thousands of people out there that are waiting for the call to, eva to be evangelized, to, to be given an opportunity to join the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I would encourage you to consider praying and asking the Lord to press on your heart what He would have you to give to support the evangelism of the Carolina Conference. May God bless you. Scotty, I tell you, it's exciting when you hear stories about how God brings people to our churches and how he uses different ministries to accomplish that. We're thankful for amazing facts and what they do, and we're thankful for the ministry that your church provides that allows people who have been convicted by the Holy Spirit to make their way into a Seventh-day Adventist church. We're thankful for the people that were there that were able to embrace him and love him and welcome him into their fellowship. And as you mentioned, Scotty, we have lots of different ways in the Carolinas to be part of that, to partner with people in ways that will allow God to move on their hearts and for them to understand the message that God has for a people prepared to receive Jesus Christ when he comes in the clouds. And I want to pray right now for the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that brought Tommy into your fellowship, that that same Spirit will move upon our hearts. I invite you to pray with me. Spirit of the living God, we pray that you would fall afresh on us, that you would move us with compassion, the compassion of Jesus as he looked out over the city and wept. Father, may we weep for the souls that are lost and wandering, looking for Christ. May your heart, may our hearts be moved and touched so that we might be engaged in a way that will help bring them to the foot of the cross. Lord, we can do that through our presence, but we can also do that 
through our offerings that would help others to go before. So, Father, we can pray and we can ask for your spirit to move, but sometimes we, we need more than that, Father. We need for you to move upon us, move us to action. And so, Father, may we be moved to action this evening that we might give a sacrificial gift that would be multiplied like the loaves and the fishes, that your kingdom can be expanded and that we might be able to look out when we get into the kingdom and see the hundreds and thousands of souls that are there because of our faithfulness and conviction and submission to you. Thank you in Jesus' name, amen. We want to welcome our speaker for this evening, Elder Mark Finley. Mark Finley and his wife, Tini, have been doing evangelistic efforts all around the world. Over a hundred different evangelistic meetings, some in Russia, and you may have heard of those, as well as uh, many places across the world. Right now, they operate a training center for evangelism in Haymarket, Virginia. But it's my privilege to introduce Mark because I've had the opportunity to work alongside of him in my churches and in regional field schools. I am so glad that you are here with us, Mark. Let me lift you up in prayer. Heavenly Father, bless Mark as he shares with us from your word. Bring us courage, bring us information, bring us hope, O oh Lord. Speak through your servant in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm delighted that you've joined us for this series titled Three Cosmic Messages, Earth's Final Conflict. In this series, we're focusing on the book of Revelation, but specifically on three messages in Revelation, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 to 12. When many people think of Revelation, they think of mystic symbols. They think of strange beasts. They think of weird images. But yet Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 says the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus to grant to us insight into the last days of earth's history and prepare us for the coming of Jesus. In fact, Revelation chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed are they that read and hear and do the things that are therein. So as we study the book of Revelation, but particularly this very heart of Revelation, Revelation 14, 6 to 12, we are studying the very messages of Christ to prepare people for Jesus' soon return. I want you to bow your heads with me just now as we pray and ask God to come in a very special way to minister to our hearts, to speak to our hearts, to impress us with his last day message. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we open your word, as we study the book of Revelation, I pray that the words would leap right off the page, that the Holy Spirit would guide, direct, and strengthen us. Guide us as we go into this presentation today, a moment of destiny. I pray thee in Christ's name. Amen. Now let me review just for a moment our last presentation for you in this series, Three Cosmic Messages or Earth's Final Conflict. In our last presentation, we talked about the fact that Jesus Christ is indeed Lord of all. We pointed out that Jesus is the one who had victory over Satan in the heavenly realms. We pointed out that the dragon fought against Christ, but yet the dragon Satan was cast out of heaven. In heaven, in that first episode, Jesus won and Satan lost. Satan was so vicious against Christ that he then tried to destroy Christ on earth when Jesus was born as the male child that would rule with the rod of iron. 
we pointed out that this expression rod of iron is a symbol of invincible everlasting dominion principle or rulership that Jesus again would reign and defeat Satan and Christ defeated Satan at his birth Satan tried to destroy him but Jesus was led with Mary and Joseph into Egypt directed by an angel and protected there Satan stalked Jesus all of his life and tried to destroy Jesus there but yet Jesus was victorious in the wilderness with his temptations over Satan at the cross Jesus was victorious in his resurrection Jesus was victorious and in his intercession in heaven Jesus is victorious Jesus wins Satan loses in that second episode Revelation chapter 12 gives us the panorama of history down through the ages Revelation chapter 12 reveals the plans of God and it shows us that Christ has never lost a battle with Satan yet during the great dark ages remember Revelation 12 talks about this 1260 years this period of the Middle Ages again Jesus wins Satan loses in the last days of verse history Revelation 12 comes to an end with Revelation 12 verse 17 and in Revelation 12 17 it says the dragon Satan is angry with the woman goes to make war with the last part of her seed who keep the commandments of God the issue in the last days is that Jesus will win Satan will lose and Christ will come on a rescue mission the Star Wars controversy will be over this intergalactic struggle will be over in Earth's final conflict God's people will win and Satan will lose in our program today I've titled this program a moment of destiny you feel it in your heart you sense it in your mind you know that something is going on in this world and we're at a moment of destiny things have changed in our world dramatically in the last few years there's been a moral decay there's been a loss of confidence in governmental institutions and institutions in general Western society is at a moment of destiny Western society is at a crossroads things that we counted on in the past have seemed to fade away there seems to be no compass to guide us no moral no north star to direct us Western society is in a crossroads one writer said this Christian morality is being ushered out of American social structures and off the cultural main stage leaving a vacuum in its place and the broader culture is attempting to fill the void in other words this nation that has been built on Christian principles Christian ethics has seen those ethics eroding things that would have been determined unconscionable decades ago are accepted as moral norms in our society today as we look at our society new research reveals a growing concern about the moral condition of the nation even as many American adults admit that they're uncertain about how to determine right from wrong now that is a striking statement Pew Research one of the more renowned research organizations in the United States when it surveyed Americans discovered that many were uncertain how do I determine right from wrong in other words there's no moral guide there's nothing that guides our ethical behavior many people feel if I think it's right in my own mind it must be right if I believe that something is acceptable to do I can do it so there is no guide no standard higher than the human mind many people are uncertain how to determine right from wrong 80 percent of Americans according to the Barner research group regardless of their ethnicity gender socioeconomic status or political ideology express concern about the nation's moral condition now that is absolutely staggering it's absolutely astounding 80 percent of Americans really have serious doubts concerns they're troubled they're perplexed about the moral condition of America today and the world in 1960 approximately 72 percent of the United States population said they trusted the government almost always to make the right decisions that's almost three-fourths of Americans look at how that's changed today only 19 percent of the population 
say they trust the government to almost or always do the right thing. That is 81% do not trust the government to do the right thing. 81%. When you look at that, that is a whopping large number. So what do we see happening? A loss of confidence in government institutions, a loss of confidence in political institutions, loss of confidence many in the medical care that can be provided in the United States. The United States spends more on medical care than any other nation, yet our outcomes are not in the top 25. There's longevity is much longer in many other nations than in America today. So people are losing confidence in, in society in general. There's this new spirit of rugged individualism that's coming back where people begin to feel, I have to care for myself, but yet they're incapable of doing that. Lives tend to be more stressful, more harassed, um, and uh, people's lives seem to be falling apart our society is a society in trouble. When popularity is more important than purity, a nation is in trouble. When money is more important than morality, a nation is in trouble. When entertainment is more important than ethics, a nation is in trouble. When pleasure, indeed, again is more important than purity, a nation is in trouble. When there's confusion of sexual roles and sexual orientation and God's original plan of one man married to one woman for a lifetime is flagrantly violated, a nation is in trouble. And when children, even of kindergarten age, first grade age, are, are given a choice of various genders, some choices of 5, 10, 15 genders, say so you choose which one you are. A nation is in deep trouble when the roles are confused in sexual lines. When crime is rampant in our streets, when Christ is mocked in our schools, a nation is in trouble. When we look at these signs in our society, we sense that we are living in the days of the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Those great prophecies that Christ gave in Matthew chapter 24, the signs of His coming, those great prophecies that Christ gave in Luke 21 of the signs of His coming in 2 Timothy, and particularly the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation was made for this generation. The three messages that God gives to us in Revelation are messages for this time at this hour of earth's history. The ancient prophets speak to this generation in trumpet tones and their messages come echoing and re-echoing down the chorus of time. They speak to us in thunderous tones in this age, in this moment of earth's history. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 24 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now underline that carefully. Righteousness exalts a nation. Nations are great because nations are good. And when a nation ceases to be good, it will soon cease to be great. Now that may take a period of time. Babylon ruled the world, but yet its moral foundation crumbled and, nation, and, and Babylon was conquered by Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia ruled the world and then it crumbled. Greece ruled the world and then it crumbled. And you come to the Roman Empire and you look at Rome, how it ruled for many years, 168 BC to about 351 AD, but yet it too crumbled. Proverbs chapter 26 verse 2 says, like a flitting sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without a cause shall not alight. Now that language is a little bit old in its reading, but we still get the point. But let me show you a little more modern translation. It says, as the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. The curse causeless shall not come. So when a nation experiences this moral decay, there is a cause and effect relationship. There are parallels in Western society with Rome's collapse. Some of you will recall the monumental volumes written about the history and collapse of Rome 
by Edward Gibbon. He finished 20 years of research in 1787. And one of the great set lessons of that book are his summary of the reasons Rome fell. And in the book, he talks about the waning morality of Rome. He talks about the moral degradation of Rome, the sexual immorality. He talks about the heavy taxation upon the people, the class structure in Rome. In the first century, the Roman population was just over a million, as clear as we can tell. It was about a million, 200,000 at times, but yet a third to 40% of that population were slaves. So you have this great class structure in ancient Rome and uh, the division of class structure, the very rich and the very poor. So Gibbon talks about the fact in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire of this moral decline, heavy taxation, wealthy getting wealthier because of the poverty of the people. He talks about the slavery, the dehumanization of human beings. But then he gives three major reasons. Here they are. Number one, he says that Rome had this mad craze for pleasure that sports became every year more exciting and more brutal. Well, you, you know, we have a movie called The Gladiators, but the Romans had the real thing, and they had what the gladiator games, and people jammed the Colosseum, and as the gladiators fought, thumbs up was spared their life, thumbs down was cut off their throat. Can you imagine that, having pleasure from the bloodshed, from brutality of seeing lives taken? Um, Yet today, you look at uh, the video games that kids are playing, violent video games. What's this doing to the human mind? You look at TV and movies and DVDs with the glorification of bloodshed, the glorification of violence. And so Gibbon says, when a society has this mad craze for pleasure, in fact, one Roman writer wrote that all of Rome wept when its favorite team lost the chariot races in the Circumus Maximus. People would get out early in the morning, line up. When pleasure dominates your life, when the scintillating desire for pleasure fills your life, and that becomes the summum bonum of existence. And when good, hard, honest work does not, there comes a time when society is on the verge of moral collapse. Secondly, he says that Rome built gigantic armaments when the real enemy was within. The decadence of the people was the real problem. They wanted to protect from the enemy without, but the real problem was moral decay. Nations are changed not by legislating morality, but by transforming the hearts of people. Rome overextended its military. Money was lavishly spent to build their army and their infrastructure crumble. Thirdly, in Rome, there was a decay of religion. Faith faded into a mere form. It was not that there was no religion, but it lost touch with life. It became impotent to warn and guide people. When you look at the fall of Rome and the collapse of Rome, you see those modern indicators in our society today. You see in our society this love for pleasure, this erosion of morality, this craze for things and the getting of more things if those external things can satisfy our inner needs. America needs a moral revolution. The Western society needs a religious revival that would bring transformation. The book of Revelation describes two great movements that will take place in the last days of earth's history. The first movement is an attempt to change society by legislation church and state unite. There's a form of religion. There's attempt to coerce religious behavior. But there's a second religious revival that the Bible speaks about, a genuine. In the first, there's legislative morality. In the first, there is the working of demons and spiritualism. In the second, there is a genuine heartfelt commitment to Christ, 
lives are changed and society is changed not by legislation but because people are transformed by the grace of Christ. The revival in Revelation is a revival that comes because three angels flying in mid-heaven have an eternal everlasting message, three cosmic messages in this final conflict and men and women accepting those messages are transformed by the grace of Christ. Their lives can never be the same again and they live for Jesus and the light of this of his love lightens the earth with his glory if nations are ever to be changed it's because there is a radical moral transformation in the hearts and minds of its people and that is precisely that is precisely what the book of revelation is about that's precisely what the messages of the three angels these three cosmic messages are about the change of society by the change of people people transformed by God's grace, people that understand the age that we're living in, and people who understanding these three messages have their lives changed. Pictured as angels flying in the midst of heaven, three eternal messages, three universal messages, three messages that go to the ends of the earth to prepare a people for the coming of Jesus Christ. I love what James Russell Lowell wrote, once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth and falsehood for the good and evil side. That's what Revelation is all about. It's about truth. It's about falsehood. It's about the preparation of a people for the coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds of heaven. This book of Revelation leads every human being to make eternal choices. It is now time, now time in this generation to make eternal decisions. It's now time on our knees to plead with God and say, God, show me your truth. You may be viewing though this program and this series of programs on three cosmic messages, and you may be a truth seeker. All around the world, God has truth seekers, people that are crying out, people that want to know God, people that long to know his last day message for this world. And God has not led you to this series of programs by accident. You have not watched this DVD, watched this YouTube presentation, watched this television production. You've not done it by accident. The Spirit of God has been working in your heart. And God's going to unfold truth to you. God's going to reveal truth from His Word to you. And as He does, He invites you to take a step, eternal step, to walk in that way of truth. There'll come a day when every human being on planet Earth will have made their final irrevocable decision. Just like Noah, who entered the ark with his family, preached for 120 years that rain was going to come. People felt he was foolish, but he entered that ark. The door was closed, and when the door was shut, it was shut. Just like in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, where God hastened Lot and his family out of the city, but then the fire fell. So there will come a time when God will say it's enough. There'll come a time when the message of Christ has gone to the ends of the earth. The Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, then the end will come. When every human being has had that opportunity to make their final irrevocable choice, when they've had that opportunity to make a choice for Jesus, then indeed the end will come then indeed Christ will return. The book of Revelation describes those two classes. Revelation's last day message leads us not merely to have information in our head, but it leads us to make divine, eternal, irrevocable choices for the kingdom of God or for the kingdom of the evil one. The book of Revelation is a book of contrasts. Now, Revelation chapter 14 is the heart of our study in this particular series. And Revelation 14 is divided into three parts. The first part is verses 1 to 5. Revelation 14 describes a group called the 144,000. This group, called the 144,000, stand on the sea of glass. That is, they are living there in eternity with Christ. They have been redeemed from the earth. 
This term, the 144,000, is a character term. It describes the character of a group of people who are totally sold out for Christ. Not necessarily a literal number, but a term to describe those people who are redeemed when Jesus comes. Then Revelation 14, 6 to 12 describes the message that prepares this group of people. It's God's last day message with a final judgment announced. And that is the message that we are going to be looking at in this series, Three Cosmic Messages. But to understand the message, you have to understand the entire chapter. Then verses 6 to 20 describe six angels. The first three angels announce the final judgment. These six angels totally describe the Judgment in the first three, they announce the final judgment, and the last three talk about the execution of this judgment. Now let's pause on that a little while to make it plain for you so you understand. In the first... Our local tithe and offering. Um, our special offering, of course, today is for church expense, so... Uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask the deacons would uh, pass play and we can take our offering.
eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining your power and love as we sing holy 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 And the last three talk about the execution of this judgment. Now let's pause on that a little while to make it plain for you so you understand. In the first angel that flies in the middle of heaven, the Revelation 14 verse 6 says, I saw another angel flying in the middle of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. So this first angel announces the judgment. The second angel that flies, the second cosmic message in Earth's final conflict, announces the fall of, of Babylon, which is a, series, a system of religious confusion, a system that is contrary to God and his word, a system in which falsehoods are substituted for truth. And we're going to study this in this series very carefully. 
the third angel is judgment upon the beast. So there's first the announcement of judgment, then judgment on all fallen religious systems that pretend and that exhibit themselves as righteous, and then thirdly, judgment upon the beast. Then the last three angels execute that judgment. And that's what we're going to look at now, this final execution of this judgment. I looked and behold, Revelation 14, verse 14, a white cloud. And on the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. Who do we see on that cloud? We see the Son of Man. We'll study that expression. And what does he have on his head? A golden crown. So three things in the text. First, a white cloud. Jesus descending on the white cloud. Second, the expression the Son of Man. And third, a golden crown on his head. Now you will remember that in Acts chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says, while they watched, he, Jesus, was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So the disciples, gazing up into heaven, see Jesus ascend into heaven on the clouds. He will return on the clouds. So Revelation 14, verse 14 and onward, are the description of Christ returning in the clouds just as he ascended in the clouds. Man steps off a mountain and goes down. Jesus stepped off a mountain and went up as he ascended because the laws of gravity cannot keep the creator of gravity down. But here he now is not ascending in the clouds because what did the angel say? This same Jesus that you've seen ascend into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go, he will come. So the prediction in Acts chapter 1 is that the Christ that ascended in the clouds will return in the clouds. That's what the angels say, men of Galilee, that is the disciples. Why are you standing gazing here into heaven? This same Jesus, the Jesus that walked the streets of Galilee, that trod the cobblestone of uh, Jerusalem, that touched the eyes of the blind and they were opened and the ears of the deaf and they were unstopped. This Christ is going to come again. And that's what Revelation is all about, this same Jesus that was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you've seen him go up in heaven. He ascended in the clouds, he will descend in the clouds. That is the message of the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 14, we go on to the second phrase. What is that second phrase? I looked and behold, a white cloud. He went up in the clouds, he's coming in the clouds. One sat like the Son of Man. Now notice the expression, the son of man. He has a golden crown on his head, in his hand a sharp sickle. Sickle represents reaping, crown represents victory. But it's this expression, the son of man. The son of man is used throughout the Gospels. It's used, in fact, 82 times in the Gospels. And it's especially used in the Gospel of Matthew. The son of man expression is a very common expression to describe the Christ that identifies with us, everything you go through, Christ has already gone through. Everything you experience in life, Christ has already experienced. The sorrow, the disappointment, the heartache, the temptations, Christ is victorious for you. He has overcome in your behalf. As we trust him, we can overcome. Now, when you see the expression of the Son of Man, particularly in the Gospel of Matthew, it is often linked to the second coming of Christ, very often. Now, for example, Matthew 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man, did we read about the Son of Man in Revelation? We did. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Then he will reward each one according to his works. When we have the expression, the Son of Man in the Bible, it often is in harmony with Christ's coming in glory and harmony with judgment. Because you see here it says he'll reward everyone according to his works. So when we read about the Son of Man throughout Matthew, here's another example in Matthew, Matthew 24, verse 27 and 30. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will what? Mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So in Revelation, when we read about the Son of Man, we read about Jesus Christ coming in the clouds. We are reading about a time of final judgment where every human being will make their eternal, everlasting 
decision for or against Christ. Matthew 25, 31, another good example. When the Son of Man comes in His glory. Do you notice all these texts in Matthew talk about the Son of Man coming how? In His glory, with judgment. That's the theme of Revelation. And all the holy angels with Him. He will sit on the throne of His glory. Throne implies rulership. There's been a battle for the throne in the universe ever since Satan rebelled in heaven against God and was cast out of heaven. Satan has desired to usurp God's throne in this intergalactic struggle, in this Star Wars controversy between good and evil. There's a battle for the throne. Is God the rightful ruler of the throne? Is Jesus the legitimate Son of God to rule with His Father on the throne? Is Jesus the rightful one that can wear the crown upon His head, the crown of glory upon His head? Is He worthy of our worship and our loyalty? Is He a, truly a God of love or is He a vindictive God of wrathful tyrant? So three things are this idea the Son of Man indicates. One, that Jesus will come again. Second, that he'll execute judgment when he comes. Third, that the destiny of all nations and the destiny of all humanity will be decided for eternity when Christ comes. Now, the Son of Man is not a unique phrase to the book of Revelation or to the book of Matthew. The book of Daniel is also a prophetic book. And here in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, we also read about the Son of Man. Daniel chapter 7, nations rise and fall, Babylon rises and falls, Medo-Persia rises and falls, Greece rises and falls, Rome rises and falls. There is a religio-political power that usurps the authority of God and the people of God are persecuted. And then the eyes of the prophet are taken from earth and they're focused on heaven. And this is what it says. I beheld till thrones were put in place. You see, it's the battle for the throne, the cosmic struggle. The Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow. The hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like fiery flame. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set. The court was seated. The books were open. I watched and one like the Son of Man came before him. So here is this cosmic judgment in heaven. Here is this judgment that settles the destinies of all human beings. We're going to study more about it in a future study. But when we read about the Son of Man, we're reading about the coming of Christ. We're reading about judgment. We're reading about something significant. We're reading about a last day message that calls all humanity to commit their lives to Christ in the light of God's last day judgment. We're reading about a heavenly court that has been seated, a son of man in the ancient of days that come forth to settle the destinies of every human being. Now the question in the judgment is not necessarily, well, if I've committed more good deeds than bad deeds, I'll be saved. My good deeds are not weighed against the bad deeds. But the question in the judgment is, what have you done with Christ? Are you totally sold out for Christ? Are you totally committed to Christ? Have you given your life to Christ? Is the longing of your heart to live in the glory of his love, in the atmosphere of his grace? What have you done with Jesus? You see, on the cross of Christ, his sacrifice was enough. His death was enough. His atonement on the cross was enough. His forgiveness is enough. His mercy is enough. His grace is enough. And what the judgment shows, this final judgment that takes place shows, is that Christ has done everything necessary to save you and me. Now remember when we read there in Revelation, the 14th chapter, you remember we read, I looked and behold a white cloud, Christ coming upon that cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man. That refers to the second coming of Jesus, the one who lived on earth with us, the one who walked and talked with us. This Christ who healed the sick, who opened the blind eyes, who unstopped the deaf ears. This Christ, this Jesus who forgave the woman caught in adultery, who assured the thief on the cross of salvation. He is the Son of Man. He identifies with us. He's coming again. He is not a God that's far off. He's a God that's near. But he has on his head a golden crown, a golden crown. 
Once he wore the crown of thorns, but now he comes and he's going to wear the crown of glory. Once he wore the crown of suffering, now he's going to wear the diadem of righteousness. Here, the word there, crown, he comes with the golden crown, is Stephanus. And that means the victor's crown. Jesus is coming again in brightness. He's coming again in glory. He's coming again, my friend, to take you home. He's coming again with the victor's crown as the triumphal Lord. Revelation 14, verse 15 tells us, I saw another angel come out of the temple crying with a loud voice to sit to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle. Notice this angel comes out of the temple. He comes iridescent with the glory of God. He comes from the presence of God and he says, thrust in your sickle for the time has come for you to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. He comes, he descends and he comes to the reaping angel and he comes from the presence of God and this angel comes to the next angel and he says, the time is here. Go get my children, bring them home. God has given the divine pronouncement. It's time my people are charmed by my love. My people are transformed by my power. My people are filled by my grace. My people have gone out to witness to this world. The world has been lit with the glory of God. It is time. Sin and suffering will be over. Disease and disaster and death will be over. Confusion and chaos and calamity will be over. Pestilence and poverty will, and pollution will be over. It is time. Jesus tells the angel, the angel tells another angel, did you see what it says here? Another angel came out of the temple from the presence of God. He cries with a loud voice to him who sits on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap. The time has come for you to reap. The harvest of the earth is ripe. Now, Revelation chapter 14 speaks about two harvests, the harvest of golden grain and the harvest of gory grapes. There is another harvest. The first harvest is the harvest of golden grain. The second harvest is the harvest of gory grapes. You see, every seed goes to harvest, every seed. There is no middle ground, there is no neutrality. In the last days of Earth's history, we will either see the fullest manifestation of the righteousness of God in the history of the universe, or the fullest manifestation of the wicked evil of Satan in the history of the universe. When the last days of earth's history come, we will see this earth lit with the, lightened with the glory of God, and we will see the powers of God work in ways we've never seen before, and we'll see the powers of hell work. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit from above in fullness of power will call forth the spirits of demons from beneath. Every human being will make their final irrevocable decision to harvest golden grain or gory grapes. Another angel came out of the altar who had power over fire. See, the power over fire, what is that? It's the destructive fires that come from the divine presence of Christ when he descends from heaven on the cloud. His righteous character destroys the wicked. His, his restraint has been withdrawn. His protection has been withdrawn. And in a sense, by their very choices, they destroy themselves in the presence of God. Revelation 14, 17 to 20 says, thrust in your sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and he gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. You see, the book of Revelation is a book of contrast. There is the Lamb of God, Christ, and the dragon, Satan. There is the seal of God, God's special sign, and there's the mark of the beast. There is New Jerusalem from above and Babylon from beneath. There are the spirits of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the spirits of demons. In the book of Revelation, it's a book of contrast. And here in Revelation 14, we have the two harvests, golden grain, men and women sold out for God. You remember what Dwight L. Moody said, the world is yet to see that man, that woman who is totally committed to Christ I will be that man, I will be that woman, you say. The world is yet to see. 
a manifestation in a corporate whole of a group of people in the last days of earth's history who want nothing else but Jesus. They want nothing else but his love. There have been individuals who've made that choice down through the generations. But in the last days of earth's history, Jesus will say, here are they that keep the commandments of God and of the faith of Jesus. Here is a group of people who have Jesus' quality of faith in their lives. And his faith shines out from them and leads them to live godly, obedient lives. But here's another group of people who are possessed with the spirit of demons. Here's another group of people who are not possessed with the Holy Spirit. Every seed goes to harvest. And the Bible says blood came out of the wine press up to the horse bridles for 600 furlongs. What's that, 600 furlongs? What's that all about? Often when we talk about Bible prophecy, God gives it in relation to, to the nation of Israel. In the New Testament, spiritual Israel is God's church. And uh, what's this talking about, 600 furlongs? In the Bible, a furlong is about an eighth of a mile. 600 furlongs, 183 miles or thereabout. That's from the north of Israel to the south of Israel. So what is God saying? He is saying simply this, wickedness will be totally destroyed. If you take Israel as a symbol of God's people, you can then say that the wickedness of this world will be totally absolutely destroyed and God's people will ultimately eventually totally triumph. This scene is that every seed goes to harvest and God's people triumph and the seeds of wickedness or evil are totally destroyed. The book of Revelation describes once again the victory the glorious victory of Jesus Christ and the victory of his people. The Christ that created the world with everlasting power will lead his people to triumph. The Jesus that triumphed over Satan on the cross, the Jesus that triumphed over Satan in his death will lead his people to everlasting triumph. The Christ that ascended to heaven, this Jesus, this same Jesus you saw go up into heaven, we read it in Acts chapter 1, this same Jesus is coming on the cloud. He is the Son of Man. He's coming with the cloud, with the crown of glory upon his head. Wickedness will be destroyed. Righteousness will triumph. The fruit we produce in our lives is the result of the seed that we sow in our lives. The harvest does not take place in a moment. The harvest of earth takes place as the result of the sowing of seeds that men and women are doing in their lives right now. You cannot sow seeds of evil and reap righteousness. You cannot sow seeds of immorality and reap purity. You cannot sow seeds of dishonesty and reap honesty. Can I be very open with you? If you are filling your mind with the garbage that comes over mass media. If you're filling your mind with video games of violence, that is not gonna produce a character that stands in the last days. If you're filling your mind with the smut and the immorality in video games, if you're filling your mind with the pornography on the internet, if that is dominating your mind, you will not be part of the harvest of golden grain, you'll be part of the harvest of gory grapes. If, you're, if you are not honest, but to t you take advantage of your boss and are dishonest in your work and cheating and lying, that will not produce the harvest of righteousness. You cannot sow the seeds of worldliness and reap heavenly mindedness. You can't do it. You can't sow the seeds of intemperance and reap health. If you are abusing your body with alcohol, with tobacco, if you're eating whatever you want, if your body has become a funhouse rather than a temple of the living God, you see, these messages are calling men and women to decision. They're calling men and women to, to fix their minds on the things of eternity. They're calling men and women to be committed to the everlasting Christ. Notice, there's a wonderful statement in a book that I love called Great Controversy, page 555. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it can dwell. 
the mind is gradually adapting itself slowly, imperceptibly. The mind is adapting itself, Jesus says, Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In every harvest, there are distinct and somewhat certain laws of sowing and reaping. And in this final harvest, there are certain laws of sowing and reaping. The Bible says in Galatians 6, verse 7, do not be deceived. I don't want to be deceived to you. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Now notice the expression particularly, God is not mocked. That's an interesting word. You remember the New Testament's written in the Greek language. And this God is not mocked, it means, muker is the Greek word, it says to turn up your nose at, to treat with contempt, ridicule, or, or, or disrespect. So in other words, you can't treat God with disrespect. You treat God with disrespect if you think you're going to sow impurity and reap purity. You, sow, you treat God with disrespect if you think you're going to reap dishonesty, sow dishonesty and reap honesty. You, sow, you, you treat God with disrespect if you think you're going to reap sow worldliness and reap a, a, a heart of, of righteousness. It's, it's just not going to happen, friend. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, what's going to happen? Whatever he sows, he's going to, he's going to reap. If you sow good seed, you're going to have positive results. And it's never too late to begin sowing good seed. You sow good seed in your life, you begin to read the Bible and fill your mind with the things of the Word of God. You get on your knees and seek God and pray. You fill your mind with that which is noble, pure, holy, just, true, righteous. And you build a righteous character. But if you sow seeds of worldliness, you don't produce righteousness. If you sow evil seed, you're going to have the negative results in your life and character that come from that negative seed. Everything reproduces after its kind. You don't plant carrots and expect a tomato to pop up out of the ground. You don't sow a seed of corn and expect a potato to come up out of the ground. You sow corn seed, you're going to get corn. We reap what we sow, but you know what? we reap a lot more than we sow. No farmer in the world is going to sow one kernel of corn and expect to get one kernel back. You're not going to sow one little tomato seed and expect to get one tomato back. Not a, we reap what we sow in kind, but not in quantity. Young person goes out and parties, gets half drunk, gets in the car, drives home, hits a telephone pole and ends up a quadriplegic. You see, you reap a lot more than you sow. You go out some night and, and you commit immorality, thinking it's fun. The girl gets pregnant and your whole life is changed. Your whole life is dramatically changed. God invites you to sow good seed. The decisions we make now are preparing us for eternity. They're not casual decisions. They're not lighthearted decisions. They're not decisions that have no consequence. The decisions we make have, have consequence. We cannot sow discord in the family and produce unity. We cannot sow lies and produce truth. We cannot sow sin and produce holiness. If we sow indifference to God and spiritual values and priorities, we reap the fruit of indifference, of apathy and spiritual complacency and frustration in our lives. This is the time to make an eternal decision for Christ. This is no time for playing around. This is no time for, for playing games with religion. This is the time to sow good seed. Somebody said, sow a thought and you reap a what? Act. You sow an act and you reap a what? Habit. You sow a habit and you reap character. And you sow character, and according to the book of Revelation, you reap a destiny. The book of Revelation is about a lot more than mystic symbols. It's about a lot more than strange beasts. We're going to study those, but it's about character. It's about a final harvest and God's appeal to your heart. God's appeal to your heart, wherever you are, to make an eternal decision for Him. The promise and warning of Scripture in the book of Revelation 
is that we reap what we sow. What are you sowing in your life right now? What are you sowing in your life? Now, there are two fatal mistakes that Christians make. First, they look at their past and say, I've sown so much evil seed, my life is ruined. The next mistake they make is they look at the future and say, I, I, I don't think I could ever possibly, even if I make a choice today, I don't think I could live in harmony with God's will. I, I've failed so many times in the past. Yesterday is a memory. Tomorrow is a dream. This moment is yours. You have it now, today. You can't do anything about yesterday, very little about it. Tomorrow has not yet come, but today is yours. Would you like to say, Jesus, do a new thing in my life today. Do a new thing in my life today. God is willing you to do a new thing in our lives right now. It's harvest time. And Jesus says to you, this moment, choose you this day. Who you will serve. And let it be the Lord. In times like these, we need a Savior. In times like these, times of moral confusion we need the certainty of God's word in times like these God is leading us to make eternal choices listen as Charles comes to sing in times like these and wherever you are why not bow your head now and say Jesus I am yours in times like these you need a savior Times like these, we need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and rips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, He's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, you need your Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle, be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, I have a savior in times like these i have an anchor i'm very sure very sure my anchor holds and grips the solid rock this rock is jesus He's the one, this rock is Jesus, the only one. I'm very sure, I'm very sure. My anchor holds and grips the solid rock. I'm very sure. Are you? Very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid, solid rock. When everything beneath our feet is crumbling, there is something that's solid that we can stand on. 
Do you remember the story that Jesus told? The story of two houses, one built on sand and one built on rock. Both houses appeared to do quite well when the sun was shining. The sky was blue and fair. But when the storm came, when the storm came, when the winds blew fiercely, when the rains beat down, the house built on the sand collapsed, and the house built on the rock stood firm. Anybody that builds their life on the sand of human opinion, on the sand of human strength, on the sand of human ability, when the storm comes, will be swept away. But anybody who builds on that solid rock of Christ, will endure the last days of earth's history in Christ, by Christ, because of Christ, and through Christ. Jesus' love is strong enough to hold you secure. Jesus' love is strong enough to keep you in the greatest test of this earth's history. Jesus' love is great enough to surround you and to protect you. Would you like to open your heart right now and surrender your life to that love? Father in heaven, we are so thankful that in the harvest of this world, you have given us the freedom to choose, that Satan cannot manipulate our choice. Satan cannot coerce our choice. Satan cannot force our choice. Right now, we feel the prompting of your Holy Spirit. We open our heart to your love, your salvation, your strength, and your power. Keep us in the center of your will. We choose just now to make eternal decisions, to sow good seeds of character, so that we can one day live with you in heaven forever. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for joining us in this series, Three Cosmic Messages, Earth's Final Conflict. Don't miss one of the series. Next presentation, I will look very deeply into Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. God bless you as we go. I believe that's it for today, not for the entire day. Please go on the website, and there are several other um, programs that will follow this. So when you go home, get on the website. I'm sure that there is a schedule on the website, because Mark's going to be uh, speaking for the rest of the day. Thank you for, for being here. Thank you for, for coming. So we stand now for benediction. <coughs> Father in heaven, we are indeed grateful that you have given us this day. Help us to be willing and desirous and able to present ourselves to you for faithful service, present ourselves to you so that we can allow you to save us. Be with us now as we leave this place to go to our several places of abode and help us to be able to enjoy the rest of the Sabbath day and the messages that are there for us. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, you may be seated. Uh, you can be uh, rushed, ushered out by the deacons.